Eat, Sleep, Box and Repeat. We're back with another video um, dissecting this time the welterweight division, which again on the world scene is, is stacked with some phenomenal talent. And domestically, we've got quite a few good um, fighters at 147 as well. I'm delighted to be joined by Neil. Neil, how are you? Very good, man. How are you? Yes, all good. Can't complain. Ready to get my teeth stuck into, into this welterweight division. So without further ado, um, firstly, I want to ask you, on the domestic scene, um, out of all those, I know we were discussing before a few of the names, you know, your likes of Connor Ben, your likes of Josh Kelly, if he stays there, you know, your Echo Essamons, further down, you got your you got your McKinsons, your Crockers, your Congos. Out of all of these fighters, um, who, what would you, what is your dream domestic fight? Um, well, for me, the number, well, my favourite domestic guy to watch is Connor Ben, without a shadow of a doubt. So it would certainly be him. And I think a good test would probably be someone like Josh Kelly. Um, you know, he's had a, a great run. They're uh, a fairly similar level in the amount of fights that they've had. Um, obviously, Kelly's uh, had that upset loss. Well, it wasn't, yeah, I suppose, an upset, but he had that loss. But, you know, he was doing pretty well in that fight. Um, and... You know, I think, you know, if, if he was a rematch, they, he'd probably do quite well. So I think a good test for both guys. Uh, obviously, it'd be more of a dangerous fight for Conor Ben because after fighting more notable names on, like, the world stage with, like, Chris Algieri, it might look like a backward step in terms of his career. He's now chasing bigger names that, you know, the American audience are familiar with. But um, I think if those two were to meet, we'd see... You know, two guys coming forward, their styles would just be perfect for each other. Both guys like like to get stuck in, throw hard shots. So I think if that did happen, you know, domestic or well, British boxing fans would have a, a, a fight to remember. It's funny what you're saying there. You know, um, it's all, about 12 months ago, yeah, about a year ago, you know, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like most boxing fans would have said that it was Conor Ben who was a wee bit behind Josh Kelly. Um, but obviously since then Ben has kind of gone come on leaps and bounds just has improved in every single fight and looked exceptional against Chris Algieri and eventually got that knockout as well um, and then Josh Kelly has obviously risen and then got beat by Avanessian um, and quite a lot of people I know people were kind of seeing that as a 50-50 I personally thought that was going to be the coming out party for Josh Kelly it obviously wasn't um, but yeah it's an interesting what you say there because I think that 12 months ago you probably would have made Josh Kelly the favourite. But now you can may really make an argument for Conor Ben being the favourite in that fight. So, yeah, I, I have to agree with you there. I think it's a great fight. Um, for me, I there's a few... <laughs> at the very start there, I mentioned, you know, your Michael McKinson's of the world, who obviously had a great win over Chris Congo. Um, you, you've got you've got your Echo Isman as well. Um, but, you know, if, as people can pick up from the accent, um, we've got a... We've got a nice little welterweight over here in Belfast called Lewis Crocker. Um, and I'm not saying he, I'm, he's definitely not on the level of Conor Ben or anyone like that yet, or your McKinson's or your um, Kelly's. But I'd really like to see Lewis Crocker against Chris Congo. Um, I know Greg, who also does videos on the channel and does the predictions, um, we have a we have a good bit of crack about about this fight because I'm he firmly believes Congo would win. And I firmly believe that Lewis Crocker would win. Um, so it's just a fight that... Again, I don't know whether I'm just, I don't actually think it, it's unlikely it would happen, you know, with Congo being on Sky and Boxer and Crocker kind of being MTK, Conlon Boxing. I don't know whether or not the fight would happen, but, you know, that's the point of this discussion, isn't it? We're wanting to, to discuss our dream fights. So for me, a bit of a level, still domestic, but a bit of a level below yours. But I do think that Crocker Congo would possibly be, be a good fight. Definitely. Yeah, no, absolutely. That brings me on to, um, we kind of alluded to it there a little bit. You know, we're going to talk about our number ones um, in the whole, in the worldwide in the division. But firstly, I want to ask, you know, if you had to pick one name, who's the top of the welterweight tree um, in the United Kingdom? Well, uh, well, like, well, it's Conor Ben. But like you say, you know, would uh, would the tables have turned if we'd been talking about Josh Kelly, Conor Ben a year ago? But a lot can happen in that year. And if you if you look at Conor Ben from, say, 
2020 onwards, he had a fight against Sebastian for is it Formella, Fornella, mm -hmm. and that was supposed to be well, that was his toughest test at that time, and you know it was a really great performance, just very aggressive, you know, relentless style. That guy, you know, was made of concrete. He didn't go down. Uh, just kept absorbing shots, and then when you see him, who did he fight after that? And then we've got the Samuel Vargas destruction. So, you know, I don't think anyone ever knocked him out in the first round before. So we really see that raw power he possesses. Then we've got was it Granados? Like yeah, Granados, and that was a you know a far more disciplined approach from him. You know, he, he took his time more. We saw him use his jab a lot better, set shots up. You know, if he was, I think you can tell he's matured as a fighter now because if he was, if he had immature tendencies, he probably would have come off that Samuel Vargas first knockout win and go, right, I'm going to do this again and, and really make a noise in welterweight. But, you know, he, he had the maturity to sense what the right thing to do was and, uh, and you know, and still fought very aggressively, but didn't, get a bit overzealous and really go for it. And then obviously his last out in Chris Algieri. I think he's been stopped in the fifth before, but he got him in the fourth, um, big statement. And, you know, now he's really, right, he's well known in Britain, obviously, because of his dad and his, the good performances he's put on British TV. But, you know, now the world will take notice. Yeah, like Chris Algieri, he's not the, the creme de la creme of the division, but, He's a guy with a lot of experience. I think he started in like 2008 or something like that. So years and years of experience being in with, you know, Can Pacquiao, a whole bunch of names on his resume. So for him coming with that experience and uh, be taken out like that, I think is a, a big statement. And so just on his last three performances alone, that's for me what puts him at the number one spot. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think you kind of, I think you kind of have to have Conor Ben as your number one, don't you? Um, just quickly, I'm going to mention. So I do agree with you with Conor Ben. Um, at 147, it's funny if you look on box rec, they still have um Kel Brook and Amir Khan up there. But you know, do you are you are you in agreement with me that they're not even they shouldn't they're not even you know let's be honest they're not they're just going to fight each other and I hope that win lose or draw however the fight goes that they both retire afterwards. So for you, is it a matter like if Conor Ben fought? Amir Khan or Kel Brook tomorrow? Do you think Conor Ben would knock them both out? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that with confidence. I mean, I, firstly, I'd say it's not a fight either of them will take at this stage because why would you take a, a hungry, powerful guy uh, in the kind of twilight of your career? Um, but, you know, Kel Brook is a great counter-puncher, uh, very high ring IQ. I think he would give Ben a lot of problems. But if they were to fight, he'd be getting Cal Brook at the right time. So that for me, I think I'll just sit on the fence and say I'm 50-50 on that one. And so I, I'm I'm picking uh, Cal Brook to beat uh, Amir Khan. Not, you know, I'll probably change my mind a few times before the fight happens. But with Khan, you can, with someone who's has such great hand speed, you can never, you know, and he always starts quite well. Um, you know, if he got in a position where he he took the first four or five rounds against Ben, um, you know, and Ben was forced to be in this kind of catch-up mode, maybe he'd lose his form a little bit and that would create him problems that way. But, um, yeah, so I'm not sure. I think I'd love to see, I wish, well, you're right in that these guys probably should just retire, but I'd be very intrigued to see uh, what would happen with those. And also with the can fight, you know, we could get the classic, uh, I'm not trying to put him down here because he's achieved a lot in the sport, but, you know, throughout his career, there's been a kind of tendency to just sit in the pocket a little too long. Box as well, gets a night, you know, even against Canelo, gets uh, points advantage, gets a bit too confident, like, hey, I'm doing all right against Canelo, boom. Mm -hmm. lights off and you know in the, if you did if you stood in front of Conor Ben you know someone similar would happen if not a outright knockout then probably shaky legs for a round or two that where he could just capitalize on a slower moving can so uh yeah 
not 100% confident, but definitely in there with a good chance. I'll just give a boring answer and say 50-50 on both of them. Well, you've explained it well. So, no, I, I, I can't really disagree with you. Although I think at, both, at 35, both Can and Brook, I wasn't even going to mention them, but I suppose you kind of have to because they are technically still both British welterweights who are active. Um, and you never know. Say, for example, you just mentioned you think Brook beats Can. Say Brook does beat Can in, in, in emphatic fashion. You know, he might, he might have a new lease of life. He might believe that he's still the best in the division domestically. But then I suppose we'll see. Um, I'm moving away from the domestic scene now. We're, we're looking at the world scene. You've got your Terence Crawford, your Errol Spence, your, your Dennis Ugasses, and then obviously you've got those contenders and just below them as well. Who would you say is the number one in the division right at this moment in time? Well, it's always disputed between the number one and number two across the world. For me, it's Terence Crawford because when I when I imagine what Spence, how he'd match up against Spence or any of the other top five welterweights, I just can't see them uh, figuring out Crawford. I mean, Crawford has a tendency to let his opponents work for a while. You know, we saw that with Kel Brook. We saw it with uh, Sean Porter and, you know, in quite a lot of his fights. But when he wants to, he just flicks that switch. And he's like, right, either, you know, whether it's Kel Brook has some success and he doesn't want him to get over confident, like, OK, I'll, I'll take you down a notch now. Or in the Sean Porter fight when, you know, he thought he was winning quite comfortably. His trainer said, you might be down. And he, I don't know if you've seen the replay of this when he's in the corner. He's like, what? Might be down. Boom. Knocks him down twice. So for reasons like that, I think when you when you have a guy that's a switch hitter, who's powerful, who can kind of dictate the pace and what seems to be end it when he wants to, I, I just think, uh, I think that's a very difficult assignment for everyone else in the division. Um, it's a shame, you know, we're talking about this hypothetically because, you know, if Spence and Crawford had been around in the 80s, they probably would have fought three times already. Um, um, so, you know, it's a shame with all the politics that uh, we just have to talk about, oh, what if? And, uh, and I suppose it's fun for debate, but for me, Crawford, uh, sorry, Spence is... Uh, isn't fast enough with his combinations to really trouble Crawford. But in saying that, he's he's got tremendous power. He's good at countering. And, you know, Crawford's been caught a few times by guys who don't punch as hard as uh, Spence. So that's that's the question mark for me. If Would he get clipped and would that change? But for me, he just comes across as a guy who, regardless of what happens, he'll he'll just find that next level. Because I think in some of his performances, we didn't really see what he could have done. Um, and in, even with guys like Jeff Horn, which I think was his first fight at welterweight, he, I think he could have ended that fight a lot earlier than it did. But, you know, he just he likes to take his time. He's got no problem being patient. Yeah, see, I think, um, I think I've got to kind of agree with you. I, I've, I've always said Terence Crawford, for me, is the number one in the division. Um, and I mean, with Terence Crawford now, I know he's not with top rank anymore. I think he's, I think he's a free agent now. Um, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's doing that. Maybe he, he's saying. I think it's, I think it's Spence. Oh, I can always speculate, but I do think Crawford wants to fight. Um, it's difficult to say because we're not in the know. But you know, from the outside looking in, it looks to me like Crawford does want to fight. And it's Spence is the one. That's, he's kind of already talking about going down the UGAS um, unification route. So obviously Spence already has the WBC and IBF titles, but um, and Ugas has the WBA after beating um, Manny Pacquiao. But no, I I think Crawford's the best in the division. And as you said, it's a shame that we're talking about it hypothetically, um, and it's kind of wishful thinking. But you never know with 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 um, Crawford being a free agent now, maybe the fight can happen. Um, here's hoping it does. Now talking about the rest of the division. So outside of um, Crawford, Spence, and Ugas, who hold the four belts between the three of them. Who would you say is the best of the rest? You know, who's the best um, fighter in that division or best few fighters in that division who isn't yet a champion? Uh, well, 
immediately the first name would be Virgil Ortiz. You know, I think it's I think it's 18 fights, 18 knockouts, um, some really great performances, and he just looks like an absolute nightmare. You know, why would why would you want this guy who just you know he's, we've seen him get hurt, um, but he he picks himself back up, shakes his head, and just comes you know straight back into the pocket again. You know, keeps quite a tight guard. Uh, devastating puncher. You know, there's been guys that have quit. You know, they've he's hit them in the head, and then they've gone down voluntarily. Volunt- uh, they've they've chosen they've chosen to go down, uh, and you know it's in this. But it looks like it was a body shot because of the way they've, they've kind of just fallen to a knee um, and administered their own count there. Um, you know that kind of says all you need to know about how his punches feel to his opponents. Um, um, is it Calva? Can you say his name? Calva Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he had some problems in early on in that fight, but just, uh, just kept going. Eventually broke his man down. You know, he, he break everyone he fights. He just breaks down through relentless determination and power. Um, so I think, you know, he's certainly a guy to watch. Um, I think actually March 19th, he's fighting McKinson yeah. and, uh, that, um, I'm not, you know, immediately my gut reaction to that is Virgil Ortiz takes it purely on his punch and power, but, you know, McKinson's a, a very crafty, awkward guy. He's southpaw. He's actually a right-handed southpaw, so he's got a very powerful jab. Um, and he doesn't, you know, he makes fights ugly. He's, for me, you know, it's not the, the most fan-friendly style, I suppose, but quite often with non-fan-friendly styles, it's very effective. So it's an interesting one what will happen there. So, yeah, you're saying Virgil Ortiz, obviously, as you alluded to, 18 or no, 18 inside the distance. Um, I don't know if I can pick one. Well, he was one of the ones I was going to talk about, but... The other two I have in mind is David Avenesian, obviously. Kind of got to have him up there on, on the fringe on the world level because obviously the European champion. And in recent years, he's just looked absolutely phenomenal since, you know, being with Carl Graves and Neil Marsh. He's just, he's just kind of gone from strength to strength. And I think you've got to have him up there as one of the the main threats to the, to the welterweight throne, along with Jerome Boots Ennis who's 28 now with 26 knockouts, like Virgil Ortiz, quite young as well, very young as well. As well. And I'm just waiting for either Ortiz or Boots Ennis just to be kind of let go and onto the world scene. I know they're on the world scene, but what I mean is like to, for the challenge for a world title. But then if you're Spence or Crawford, do you want to fight one of these young guys? I know they're just Crawford's already alluded to moving up to 154. That could happen. Spence could do it as well. He's quite big. So I'm not 100% sure how it'll all play out. But I could potentially see, you know, Crawford and Spence, one of them moving up or both moving up. So then the belts would become vacant. And then the likes of Jerome Ennis and um, Virgil Ortiz, David Avanesi, and could kind of battle it out between themselves um, for the title. So, yeah, definitely an interesting division, um, as you say. And I'm looking forward to seeing over the next year to 18 months how it all plays out. Finally, I wanted to just ask you as well, um, looking at the weight division below, obviously we're looking at... Um, 140 pound division we're looking at super lightweight is there anyone there that can move from super lightweight who you think could move up to welterweight maybe not in the next year but you know soon enough and could have a big impact on the world scene uh i suppose the first name that comes to mind there is josh taylor you know he's uh spoken openly quite a few times that he wants crawford and he wants to move up and you know, he's what else is there left to do at uh, super lightweight? He's unified champion. He's got his next fight, I think, 26th of February against Jack Catterall. Um, I can't see him losing that fight. I don't think many can. He should be the big favorite going in. Um, so, yeah, one, I think once he's cleaned up super light, you know, he's got the he's got the skills to pay the bills. I I can't pick him against. Crawford as much as want to, you know, I don't pick anyone at welter or super light to beat Crawford. 
um, regardless of how good they are and, and what they've achieved. But, you know, if not Crawford, you know, there's, there's well, the thing with welterweight is it's such a tough division if we're talking about the top five guys. You know, Ugas has got that uh, classic educated Cuban style. You know, he's very economical with his shots, doesn't, uh, you know, can still be hit. But, um, and yeah, I, actually now I'm just thinking out loud. I can see him having some success against Ugas. Virgil Ortiz, so long as he keeps a really tight defence, um, you know, he could, like, you couldn't match him with power, but he's got power to, to stop people in their tracks and make them think twice about coming in again. So for a guy that loves coming in, maybe that would take him out of his game a little bit. But I think in this moment in time, uh, if we're talking about Spence and Crawford, I, I can't see him moving up in weight and, and being successful against those guys at the minute. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Neil. I really do. I think that Josh Taylor, obviously, you know, unified, undisputed champion now at super lightweight. Um, and again, he's a big super lightweight. He's de it's definitely, I can definitely see him moving up to welterweight. And you know what? Even in the future, I could see him going up to super welterweight. Obviously, that wouldn't be for a few years yet, but he does have the frame. And he, he's, he's a big lad, is Josh Taylor. So I definitely do see him moving up. And I do, I think, I think I agree with you. I think Crawford would beat Josh Taylor. But then again, you know, a lot of people thought Jose Ramirez would beat him. A lot of people thought Regis Progray would beat him. At the time, a lot of people thought O'Hara Davis would have beaten Josh Taylor. Um, and now looking back at that, how silly does that sound? Um, but Josh yeah. Taylor, he's just kind of, he's just, he's just, he's just doing all that's asked from his run. His run from winning his first world title to now has just been phenomenal. You know, you'd, you'd struggle to find a better um, three or four fight sequence. Um, bar is one easy knockover that he had. Other than that, it's been it's been absolutely flawless, really, from Josh Taylor. Um, another one from down, down in the super lightweight division who wouldn't mind seeing him move up. The only problem is he's a lot smaller. Is Regis Progre. I think he gave Josh Taylor his toughest fight so far. Um, I think he gave a tougher fight than Ramirez did, personally. The only so as I, as I mentioned there, the only problem is I think Progre is quite small in height. All, again, he's quite stocky and, and 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 big, but is he maybe just a little bit too small for the guys at one four seven? And obviously you've got you know you mentioned Ramirez. Could he eventually move up? He's coming off a loss to Josh Taylor. Does he think his days in at one forty are done, or will he be thinking flip? Hopefully Josh Taylor does move up. And then I can try and unify again at, at 140. Um, it's funny what you it's funny what you said there about um, Josh Taylor as well, because I was listening to a podcast within the last week or two, and Carl Frampton said that when he was um, he used to train alongside Josh Taylor sometimes. I think it was all when they were at the McGuigans. Um, and he says he remembers at the time Josh Taylor was just a kid that nobody read, really heard of, apart from in Scotland. And they went over to Spar um, in America and he at the time, um, Taylor wasn't very well known. And apparently he got into sparring with Sean Porter. And Sean Porter at the time, and even looking at Sean Porter recently, you know, he's been up at the top of the tree for ages, a really, really long time. And yeah, I think that, I remember Frampton saying that, oh, he, he, he didn't say he beat him up and beat him from pillar to post, but he said, you know, he was hinting at that Josh Taylor um was more than a match, let's put it that way, for, for Sean Porter, even though this was very early on in his career. So, yeah, I definitely think um, that Josh Taylor has the capabilities and all of this, the attributes to be able to move up to, to 147. Well, that's an amazing story. I mean, uh, you know, Sean Porter is a, just a hurricane, a nightmare. I'm sure even in sparring, he's just got one gear and a, an amazing engine. So, you know, that's... Uh, that's awesome story to hear. So if, if that's what he's doing early on in his career, then maybe I'll change my answer. He beats Terence Crawford. <laughs> well, listen, Neil, thanks very much. I've really enjoyed this discussion about the welterweight division. Um, guys, have a have a look at all our... We've, got, we've basically discussed every single division um, in, in boxing on our channel. Um, a few different... Lots of different opinions. All of us kind of chipping in with our thoughts. So yeah, let us know what you think and be sure to to watch the rest of our um, discussions on all of the other divisions in boxing. Finally, Neil, thanks very much for your time and I'll see you again soon. Well, thank you. See you soon, man. Cheers, Neil.